I'm now happy to introduce Suzanne Flint. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on engaging adults through programming and social media with our instructors Jane Salisbury and Annalisa Spahog. This is the sixth and final course in our online fellowship series. As we draw to a close, we want to remind you that all six courses will remain live in Moodle until June 30th. No matter what your participation level has been to date, take advantage of these final weeks to participate with Jane and Annalisa in their course, as well as to finish up or review any previous courses on Moodle while you can still have live access to the other instructors. In addition, we are currently in the process of posting the course content, sans the discussion forums, from all six courses to our TLA50 website, making these resources permanently available to you and your colleagues. We'll make an announcement on Ning once the majority of this content is successfully posted. This way, you will be able to access all of the fellowship course content, resources, and tools, and return to them whenever it is convenient for you or when you may have practical need for these resources as you move from ideas to implementation. As usual, Mary Ross and I will be assisting in today's presentation by monitoring the chat and Q&A sessions. Please be sure to differentiate your posts with comments to share posted in chat and questions for Jane or Annalisa to answer posted in Q&A. Now, let me introduce Jane Salisbury, who is the Supervisor of Library Outreach Services at Multnomah County Library in Portland, where she has worked in a variety of capacities for over the past 25 years. Jane was named a Lifelong Access Fellow by Libraries for the Future in 2006 because of her pioneering work with midlife adults in Multnomah County. She has also given several national presentations on innovative library approaches to serving baby boomers. Joining her is Annalisa Svehog, who works at HyperArts Web Development in Oakland, California, where she consults with businesses and organizations of all sizes, helping them engage with their audiences on social networks. She's been the primary architect of the Transforming Life After 50 Fellowship's various social media sites. Welcome, Annalisa and Jane. Thank you, Thank Suzanne. You, Suzanne. So Jane and I um, are going to be presenting to you uh, simultaneously, so excuse us if we ever talk over each other, <laughs> um, but I, I want to thank Suzanne for introducing us, and I'm going to be uh, moving the slide to start off with our agenda. So first of all, today we're going to talk a little bit about what you've been saying in Moodle, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how your library could make social media part of your regular programming strategy. And finally, we'll do some screen sharing where we'll look at some libraries that are using social media to promote their programming. And we're going to talk about how they are specifically targeting midlife adults on their websites and on some of their social networks. So Jane, if you want to start mm -hmm. off reading a couple of these quotes. We've gotten some wonderful comments from you and, and had a lively discussion, and we just pulled out a few things that are great jumping off um, points for discussion. Um, one, the first quote that you see, we're having a difficult time with getting people to like us on our Facebook page so that they can receive the postings about programs and services. And that's, a, that's some variation of that is a pretty common um, refrain that we've heard from you. Another quote is about policy. We've, we have our social media policy in place and have our Facebook and Twitter accounts set up, but we need to figure out a system for organizing and coordinating the process, and we really hope to address some of that today. Annalisa? And on this next slide, I have some more quotes. First of all, I hope to develop a midterm plan for the best way to use social media for our patrons instead of the hit or miss technique that's gone on in the past. And hopefully, based on some of the examples we're going to show you and what some things we'll talk about, you'll be able to get some ideas for how you can actually develop a strategy rather than just hit or miss. Secondly, uh, our service area is very tech savvy, so I don't think that's a problem. Maybe we're not using the right tools or not using them properly to attract this age demographic. And we've heard that a lot, that people may have set up a 
Twitter account or a Facebook page or a blog, but they're not seeing the type of interaction or the level of interaction that they were expecting. So hopefully we'll be able to address that issue as well. One of the things we really want to talk about is um, developing a strategy uh, as far as programming and social media go. So we want to talk about how you can promote programs specifically to midlife adults. How, um, and in, I think you've seen in your reading that, we, that we're really advocating that you use non-age specific language and marketing and, and rather appealing to people's interests, not their age. We'll see some examples today of how libraries are trying to do this on their websites. And we'll also see how they both use, they use both their websites and their social networking sites to target these audiences. Yeah, and I think it's an important question. Um, how will your patrons find you if you're present on social media sites like Facebook and Twitter? Uh, we're going to look at some of the libraries today that are using social media. and. I know that not everyone has control over their websites, um, but hopefully you'll get some ideas of how these three particular libraries that we look at today are doing some creative things. And I know it's common to, ex to experience some doubt, some fear, and deal with those emotions when it comes to beginning a social media program for the first time. And we just wanted to talk about how you're going to need to probably do some experimenting in order to find out. Uh, what works, how to answer your questions, and want to encourage you not to be afraid to try and fail. And on this next slide, I have a really great quote that we also took from Moodle. And it's long, so we're going to give you just a minute to read it on your own, and then Jane and I will share our reactions. Okay, um, is this a good time to start back up? Yeah, I think okay. so. All right. Um, we were really struck with this, um, and one of the I ideas that emerges from this quote from Garrett Kuramoto, um, he's talking about how uh, the, the sort of the conflict between the city, and that can translate to whatever mi municipality you're in, their developing of a social media policy and the library's developing of a social media policy and trying to go ahead. And <clears throat> this, I think this is a very common kind of conflict um, to, to come up. And I think it's a good time, as he says, to be bold and experimental um, and to try to take some risks. It reminds me of um, several times in the, the my career when the library has been out front with the county um, of the county in in terms of technology and so often the library can really be the the and needs to be because of the demand um, the early adopter of these kinds of things of using Facebook and social media for the for the, to meet our our goals so I think it's a, a time to kind of seize that role as an early adopter and um, just try things. Um, it, and, and realize that just like in the early days of using computers in libraries, we had to get over the idea that we could break things. And I, I think we can, we, we just need to go ahead and not worry too much about, um, about these kinds of political conflicts. That's a great point, Jane. I know when I first read this, I really liked how Garrett wasn't ashamed to admit that his library had, had kind of a rocky start with Facebook. He says that they had to pretend to be uh, a real person giving themselves a fake name like reference desk because <laughs> the tools weren't available yet and the library knew that Facebook was where they wanted to be for whatever reason but um, they had to try a couple different things before they figured out what was right and even still they're experiencing a little struggle um, trying to figure out how to properly use these tools that are available to them. Um, 
I know many of you probably work in small towns and small libraries, but hopefully this sentiment of um, finding success in or and by taking risks will inspire you. Okay, so we're going to move on and begin our screen share. And I'm actually going to be sharing my browser window with you as we look at three different libraries, one at a time. And the first one is going to be the Hennepin County Library. And as Jane and I go through the library's website and a couple of their social networks, we wanted you to think about this one particular question. What terms does your library use to target midlife adults in programming titles and descriptions? What terms could you be using? So if you think about this question as we go, um, you'll be able to post your answers into chat and we'll address them when we're finished. You ready, Jane? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> okay, so can you see my screen, Jane? Yeah, because I can't see it. Hmm. Does that okay. seem like it's yeah. working? Here, I can see it now. Okay, this great. Great. All right. Um, this is the Hennepin County uh, Library in Minnesota, and um, they're exemplars in many ways of, of great programming, and, and they have a great website. Um, but we wanted to look particularly at how they organize events by age. Um, if you look at their, their events um, page, or, or actually, yeah, if you look at the events page, um, you'll see that there is a, um, a 55, when you're trying to find an event, you'll see down there where you can filter. And you can, a filter, you can filter by adults, and you can filter by 55 plus. Um, but this, this 55 plus lumps um, midlife adults in with seniors. Um, so as kind of exploring this a little bit, if you go to the 55 plus, you get uh, some programs that are interesting and have uh, to, to midlife adults and to seniors, um, which is not a bad option. Uh, it, it gives you, you know, a, a wide variety of things to choose from. Um, but there's also the option of going back and simply checking uh, using adults as your choice. And I would argue that this is the best choice. And, it, and we've been going around and around at our system about how to reach adults with events too. And, and I think, and this is just my opinion, that the, the 55 plus is not really necessary. If you say adults, you are really reaching out to the wide variety of adults um, beyond those who are parents. And the things for parents tend to be more in the children's realm. But this category is a way of reaching everyone, um, both seniors and those who are in midlife. Um, it leads to some really appropriate programming for midlife adults, like the memoir writing workshops, the Socrates Cafe, the brain health. And it doesn't describe anything by age except in very broad terms. And when it's, when it's really necessary, for, like the health insurance for seniors, that really is something that's very specific to that age group. Um, so there are a few enough programs there that any adult of any age can browse for interest and look for that senior designation if they want, but not necessarily be insulted uh, by, by other designations if they don't want to. It's not perfect, but I don't think anyone has figured out a perfect way to do that. Um, so there's some specific programs that I thought were really well done. The Start Your Memoirs um, program, which has got the 55 plus designation on it. Jane, I'm going to try and find that because I'm not. Okay, seeing it right I'm here. sorry, I'm talking too fast. Let's see. That's okay. I think it was. Yeah. 
Hmm. I, wonder I wonder if, if it's, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just talk about it in a generic way because I think yeah. it's something a lot of libraries are doing. We have a similar program here, um, a program for writing your memoirs, which which many people start thinking about in the middle of their life and later. Um, and I particularly wanted to mention it because I think it's something that's interesting to um, – that that can be accomplished in any library, no matter how small. There's usually somebody who's a good writer and somebody who can put a, a workshop together like that. That's a great one for small towns. Um, there's one called Books You Don't Have Time to Read. Is that there? I'm looking for it. Have they changed all their programming since yesterday? <laughs> we don't have control over their website. Yeah, yeah. Um but we can kind of talk about it, I guess. We can punt, yeah. Um, what we what we were going to talk about there is the, is some terminology that you can use that does signal to an adult audience who you're after. And lifelong learning is a term that for for a long time has been used for adults maybe 50 and over, or or it, it really signals that you're talking about learning that goes on outside of the, or after conventional schooling is over, and they've used that terminology in several places here in lifelong learning. Um, and so I think you, you can watch for and use terms like that that don't really nail people by age, but are, um, but are useful for people to see. Um, it's, this site, I think, shows the struggle you know, the internal struggle to drive adults to the targeted areas of interest. They're really trying to cover all the bases. And I think adults does the job, the term, in, the term adults, though this is something that many libraries are still struggling with, including ours and, and I'm sure yours. Yeah, that's a good point, Jane. I know um, you can see lifelong learning up there in the top right or left corner. Oh, yeah, and their graphic there, yeah. <laughs> So sorry we couldn't find the exact um, event or program, but <laughs> I you think get the it was idea. there yesterday. But um, I did want to show if I go back to the Hennepin's homepage, um, go to their Facebook page and see what they're doing there. Uh, this is the Hennepin County Library Facebook page, and I'm not don't want to spend too much time just looking at this, but um, from the research that I've done, I've noticed that there is no real obvious focus on a particular age group on this page. The library promotes programs, but they also post general information. Um, here you can see that they're talking about Children's Book Week, but they're also talking about the li when the library is closed. Um, they've created a space here where people can come get timely updates like an online bulletin board and people feel comfortable commenting and liking because they've discovered that this is a place where their input is welcome as you can see. And I wanted to look at one particular post on their wall. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit here. This post here on April 11th, I'll isolate it for us so we can see. Uh, the library asks on their wall, please tell us what Hennepin County Library means to you. What role has it played in your lifelong learning process? Has the library provided an aha moment? Why is HCL important to you and your family, and how has it enriched your life? So they've asked the patrons to share what the library means to them, and you notice that they've used those code words we were talking about, lifelong learning, but they haven't really said anything specific about um, what does the library mean to you as an adult or as a kid, but it's asking everyone for their input. And some people have shared on the wall their reactions, but there's um, also a link here to their website, so we'll go back and see this is where they've asked people to post comments directly on their website in honor of National Library Week. So um, we we're looking at these comments, and some of them were just really great. Um, this woman here writes that she remembers walking to her local library as a fifth grade student, but now she's in her late sixties and she continues to use the library daily. So just getting a lot of great feedback from people at different stages in their life, sharing how the library is important to them. 
Jane, did you want to add anything about this? Um, I th no, I think, but I, th I think this is a really appealing way to get people to the the to make the connection between Facebook and your website. You can drive people to the website, and then you've captured these wonderful comments for the website, which is where most people are going. And, and uh, so it's a great way to get wonderful testimonials to place on your website. Yeah. Okay, so that was just a little look at how they're using Facebook um, and not really targeting to midlife adults but um, still getting reactions from people of all different age groups. And next I wanted to look quickly at their Twitter account. And you notice here that on their home page they have these social media icons that are really clear. So as a user, if I come to their website, I know that I can get all of the information on their website, but as well if I want to interact or see what they're doing on these social networks, I can just click here and find their Twitter account. So what they've done here is that they offer some similar services to their Facebook account where they post information and links, but they're also um, retweeting what other people are saying. Now a retweet is when you basically quote someone on Twitter. And what Hennepin has done is they find people who are talking about the library like this woman here says she loves that she can check out ebooks from the library. So glad I can move to new technology and not have to break up with my library. <laughs> and it's a great way to use patrons' comments to promote a message about the library without sending out too much of a one-way broadcast. You can see that they've also retweeted that this, um, this man said, you're never too old for a library card, and he actually shared a picture of his library card um, with that link. Now, again, there's no specific age focus here. There's no mention of providing a service specifically for teens or for adults. But um, basically, anyone with a Twitter account could find this wide variety of information useful to them. Now, I'm going to transition back to our slides. And hopefully, you've had a chance to think about this question that we asked, what terms does your library use to target midlife adults in programming titles and descriptions? And Jane, I don't know if you can see some of the quest the answers that were put in chat or Annalisa, this is Mary and I've been watching the chat and I, okay. I think that um one of the difficulties may be that since this is the first time that screen sharing has been used in a webinar, that um, the fellows may not all be aware of the fact that they can use the chat while you're doing the screen right. sharing. So we would encourage you to put your thoughts in the chat window about the terms your library is using to, um, to target the interests of midlife adults or what terms that your library could be using. And just to remind you that even while Annalisa is doing the screen sharing, you can still use the chat window by clicking on that um, Viewing Annalise's Application toolbar, and you can bring up the chat and Q&A windows while she's doing the screen sharing. And uh, now I'm starting to see comments in the chat window, Annalisa. I love the comment that from Carla Lane who says, because I, I just popped it up too to take a look, um, where she's about Garrett uh, Garrett's quotation that we use, she says, my new motto, march forward until apprehended. <laughs> I think that's really great. <laughs> yeah, that is nice. Well, mm -hmm. while, while we're waiting for people to, to comment, I also wanted to share, I think the insight that you guys are sharing that's really valuable is this using the social media to be more two directional. It, you know, I think a lot of us, and maybe it, it is folks in my age group, tend to sort of think of them as just another place where we have to constantly be putting information out. But to use it instead, you know, as asking those great questions and engaging your community that way, rather than just feeling like it's you're, it's always sort of one directional. It's a really right. important point. And I think another uh, important point is, along those lines is that is not to um, put too much, not to have uh, too overwhelming 
uh, an amount of content on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, I was talking with a friend of mine who's my age a, a, a few weeks ago about it, and she said, I don't want a steady stream of stuff from the library. That's why I think, or anybody, really. So it's, it's, it's you know, choosing carefully and sort of rationing the stuff that you put out, I think, is really important. Yeah. Jane and Annalisa, this is Mary, and I'm picking up comments in the chat. People are saying that they also are using the term adults mm -hmm. for adult programming and that they would probably switch to adult rather than using seniors. A couple are mentioning that they use the term lifelong learners mm -hmm. as well. And uh, there's an interesting question from Garrett Kuramoto who says, if we want to use adult for our midlife patrons, perhaps there are more specific terms we can use for the other non-midlife groups, like senior or parents of kids, to differentiate? I think that's a great question, and I, I was thinking more about it yesterday, and I think there are there are some really good reasons to differentiate sometimes. Um, when Obviously, when you want to reach parents, you can use the word parents. And then I think there's a place for the term senior maybe, when you're, for example, when you have a computer class that's really tailored to people who are maybe 70 and above and who may have issues of uh, vision or manual dexterity or things like that where you really want to signal that, that this class is designed to address those things. But I think there's a huge area in between parents and seniors that can really just be adults as it looks like a lot of people are agreeing with that. But, but to be really, really careful about this, you know, focused use of those terms. Well, and Gina, Gina just made a comment, too, that adult learners sounds to her like adult literacy students. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. Well, we <laughs> – the adult literacy programs are in my department in, in our system, and we've struggled with that as well. It's, it's, it's sort of like you can't uh, – you, you can't perfect it. But if you say uh, – I think lifelong learners signal something a little bit different than adult learner. And I just wanted to point out that great question from Paige, Mary. Did you want to? No, go ahead, Suzanne. My lot. Okay. Um, she's asking. So, is is it enough to just make midlife adults feel engaged by asking random questions of patrons on the page, or is there any way to get real data via social networking? Mm. Or is the ultimate goal of the social network con connection to just make people feel included? That's a great question, Paige. Um, and it what it what it, I think about first is that a lot of people are in different places with their social networking. So some libraries might just be trying to get people to interact. Period. Um, so there's not going to be tons of data there. But if you have a very active page and you feel like there is just a lot of random conversation going on, there are ways to target specific, um, you know, to get specific data if that's what you're looking for. Um, I don't know if now is necessarily the time to talk about that, but there are lots of tools. Um, you should check out Facebook Questions, which is a great way to ask a non-open-ended question on your wall. And uh, people can choose between, you know, three, five, uh, whatever number you want of answers. And Facebook will give you actual statistics of how many people have picked, you know, option one or option two. And I think someone else put in the chat, too, that Facebook does give you statistics. If you go to your insights page, tell you where people are located that are on your page. And it will also tell, me, tell you how many people have seen your uh, wall posts, the number of impressions, and the percentage of feedback. So that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Annalisa, there's also a, a couple of comments from Erica and Christine that tie directly in with what you're, you've been saying in the readings in Moodle about the need, if you're going to do a Facebook page, the need to keep the content as current as possible. Mm -hmm. And Erica in particular is saying that she sees library Facebook pages where they don't do that. Right. The last post is four months old, <laughs> and that's really working against the library. Yeah. Yeah, I know some people struggle with resources, um, and or maybe, you know, like they were feeling that what they were doing on Facebook wasn't working and they gave up. Um, so it, it's always it's always good to, if you feel like something isn't working, 
um, make a change and not necessarily just let your page die. <laughs> Try um, experimenting with different things. I mean, that brings me back to Garrett's quote where he talked about his Facebook page for his library was a profile at first, and they had to change it when Facebook came up with the new tool, Pages. So there's almost always something you can do to that will that will experiment with some new tools, try something new. I think one thing you should you can do, and I I um, may have mentioned this a couple times in our discussions online, is um, is kind of show off some library things on Facebook when you kind of run out of stuff to announce or there's nothing much going on. You can stage a little event like the Reader's Advisory thing that we did just for one day where people could. Um, you know, say, I read these three titles, give me another one, and mm. our reader's advisory librarians just did this kind of guerrilla thing all day long of, of um, suggesting titles online. So in the end, what you had was this really rich and fun discussion to read through of people getting all these fabulous title recommendations. Or you can highlight some kind of database or collection that you have in the library. You You can just kind of, well, yeah, show the library off a little bit. Yeah, that's a great idea, Jane. That reminds me of something that um, I once saw on a Facebook page was that the actual admin of the Facebook page weren't posting. They had invited a guest to come and post and answer questions on their Facebook page. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if how this would work with some library's social media policy, but, um, you know, like Garrett said, <laughs> Uh, be experimental until someone tells you to stop. But yes, you know, march maybe, forth till apprehended. <laughs> yeah, have have some a volunteer from the community answer questions about filing tax returns or job searching, and let them interact on the page. That's a mm -hmm. it's really a great way to get activity on your page is let people interact with themselves with each other. Mm -hmm. um, the library doesn't have to be the only one posting on the wall. Annalisa Marshall asked the question, can you delete a Facebook page and create a new one? Yes, you can. You might not You might not be able to transfer all of your fans if you had um, lots of fans on your old Facebook page, but if, it, if something isn't working, if you created a page for the wrong, with the wrong, I don't know, information or title, or, or you don't have that many fans and you want to start over, definitely you can delete your page. And I don't, I don't think it's wrong to be transparent about that on Facebook. People understand that, um, you know, social networking is new and it changes all the time. And so if you say, you know what, we're changing the title of our page, we're not the friends of the library anymore, we're just the library, or whatever it is, um, I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of or embarrassed about. Um, Though someone did add here that if if you do change it, you have to use a different email address for the new. Well, one. that all depends if you're uh, if you've created a an account for your library or if you've administered a library Facebook page from a personal okay. profile. Okay. So we're starting to get into some technicalities that um, I could probably answer questions about that via email. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes there's we have case by case <laughs> basis issues. Mm -hmm. I might just stick a little comment in here that I think I think that part of the resistance uh, to this not not from our participants here in this chat, but just in the library world world in general, is that libraries are I think they think of themselves as kind of monolithic without a uh, necessarily a real human face on their website. I mean I know for year we don't have names we don't have photographs of staff, we don't have anything like that. There's an anonymity that libraries like to kind of cling to, I think. And this, all, all of putting ourselves out on Facebook and Twitter um, and in other ways is very personal and more casual. And so I think, I think it really is kind of a sea change. And, and I, I, I would imagine that people have observed that in their own attempts. Yeah. I'm seeing lots of other great comments in the chat, although, Mary, I don't know if we should probably move along because we have two more 
That's what I was going to suggest because you have so much more yeah. uh, screen sharing, so many more interesting sites to share. And most and Suzanne and I have been trying to pick up the questions, and but there's been some lively discussion going on yeah. too that will be in the archive as well. And it's good to see people um, responding to each other because I know a lot of people, a lot of fellows have a lot of experience with social media, so. Um, yeah, that's, there there's a experts. whole. <laughs> yeah, there's this whole great little sub conversation about what to call your movie night at the at the library <laughs> without calling it senior or adult or whatever. And I, I think there's that. some great ideas like night at the movies or classic movie festival or whatever. I think I think you're you're answering all your own questions. It's great. Okay, so um, in the uh, thinking about time, we should move on to the next. Um, slide here. We're going to take a look at the Cleveland Public Library next. And before I go to their website, I just wanted to read this next question that we wanted you to think about. How is your library creating programs that are targeted to the interests of midlife adults? So this is kind of the next step in that, uh, the idea of what terms you're using in the description. And now, how are you targeting interests? with your programming. So I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, here's Cleveland. And um, Cleveland has wonderful resources and a really good website. I um, I admire what they've, I've been watching them over the years and they're great. But you'll notice how, <clears throat> and I'm not, singling them out, we have the same exact problem here in Multnomah County. But you'll notice how three specific age groups have taken up the prime real estate on their site, kids, teens, and seniors. Um, so they basically, they've left out the mass of adults. Um, but if you look at their programming, they have a wide variety of programs that would be of interest to many adults from any age cohort. So they're, so what we have here is a great example Oops. of a library that, let's see. I have to get back to my, away from my annotation tools. <laughs> <laughs> They're so fun. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, so what, what we have is um, a library with some really appealing offerings, but where some simple changes in the descriptions could appeal to a wider audience. So Annalise has got us here in their um, events calendar. And you can see there's a class called Microsoft Word 1 for seniors. Um, depending on this, what the content of the class is, this class could be downplayed. The emphasis on the seniors could be downplayed. And it could be promoted differently without actually changing the offering itself. You could call it, it could be recast as Microsoft Word for beginners, for example, and be less off-putting to those adults who have never touched a computer for whom this class might be just right, but don't happen to be seniors. Um, and let's look at another program. It's a great example of a program that might attract a lot of midlife adults and seniors as well, but it's described in a, it's described in a really good way, actually, to, to attract both of them and, and to put off neither of them. Um, I really like what they've done here with the description here. This is called Sneak Peek First Friday. And there's, yeah, this is a, basically uh, a gadget uh, seminar coming uh, to learn about e-readers and MP3 players and all that. And they, there's nothing in it about, oh, your grandchildren know how to do this better than you do or <laughs> anything, uh, those kinds of cliches that have, um, you know, that are out there in the world about technology. It simply says, are you curious about what's new at the library? You're not sure about all the how the digital and electronic media gadgets like e-readers and mp3 players work, come check it out. And um, it tells you about everything they're going to cover, they're having refreshments. It just sounds very appealing. And I would bet that a lot of the people who attend this would be maybe in their 50s and 60s. Um, it seems just really well targeted to me without, uh, without naming uh, you know, without using any words like boomers or grandparents or any or anything. Um, so I think that's a great example. So before we go back to our question, I just wanted to point out again that the Cleveland Public Library has done a great job of showing their social media links really clearly on every page of their site. 
Um, so if you wanted, you could find them on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. So I'm just going to go back to our slides. <clears throat> and the question that we asked before, how is your library creating programs that are targeted to the interests of midlife adults? Um, if you want to talk about that a little bit in the chat section. You know, the, there's an interesting comment from Leslie, Jane. It, it's, she says, it seems like the events on the Cleveland site are timed for seniors, <laughs> not adults that are working, because if they're using a 10.30 a.m. in the morning, 1 p.m. during mm -hmm. the week, those, are, those may not be working adults. That's a really good point, and I have to be honest and say that I didn't actually notice that, but I think you're, I think you're absolutely right there. Um, but I still think you could say beginners. You could and get uh, because what we're we're seeing a lot of demand for are um, job workshops and computer workshops for adults in midlife who are unemployed just because of the state of the economy. And um, so it, things are, I think, a little less well defined than they were in the past uh, as to what's a good time, you know. Okay, and then Sarah Kelly Chase just made the comment also in chat that they did an author series at noon, yes. so you can get working midlife adults. You can have a bring your lunch kind of um, idea for that as well. That is great. We've had a long-running series here in, in um, partnership with our community college of um, brown bags, you know, lectures and readings and stuff like that, which are really appealing, especially if you're a downtown library. Okay, and we're seeing more comments coming in as well. Bill is mentioning that they've had surveys to see what people want, and they uh, sometimes use their judgment, conduct a program, ask if they would like more of this kind of program. So that's, that sort of community needs assessment process is pretty important. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking you could ask people um, on, like, your Facebook page or Twitter what time would be best for them for programming mm -hmm. to determine, you know, when are people available. Um, is your audience people who have afternoons free or not? You can find that out. And there's an interesting comment from Garrett about the um, that they're changing their thinking about it to more strategically use the word adult and a more focused use of the word adult in programming as well. Mm -hmm. And the co a comment from Holly, Jane, that ties in directly with what you've been saying in Moodle also about targeting the interests of midlife adults. She, mm -hmm. recommend, she mentions a, a couple of particular programs, perspectives on China, the economy, et cetera. So tar again, targeting the interests of midlife adults. Yeah, and I see her comment. I, I have the chat window open too, and I see that she says, but not introspective. We've actually found that um, – a, a, a mix of things is really good because there are some – because one of the things that is common to adults in midlife pretty much across the board is transition of some kind or another, whether it's from um, being a full-time parent to um, being uh, retired or, um, you know, various things like that. And that introspection is a, is a pretty common uh, – thing that people find themselves in the middle of. And so we've had programs that are on more external kinds of great topics like China or the economy, but also some things about thinking about one's own transition and how to go about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Garrett, well, thank you, Garrett, for pointing out to me that I missed the um, question from Holly that you had been responding to. And Holly King says that regarding the kids, teens, and seniors categories, could it be that the library is assuming that all programming that isn't otherwise designated is adult programming by default, and that's how their their library tends to word their materials? Yeah, I noticed that, and I, I was thinking about, I think that might be one of the problems we have is that we, we um, that we think our patrons will assume uh, 
something when in fact I've seen people look at websites and look around for something for themselves and they don't see it because they because they don't dig deep which they shouldn't necessarily have to and they see kids teens students teachers parents and they don't where where am I I'm none of these things anymore so what what where am I um, when they don't see it at the top level Yeah, I think that's a good point, Jane. I mean, for me personally as a non-teen and young adult that I would see kids, teens and seniors and feel like there wasn't anything for me. Yeah, yeah. Um and but if if there was you know, if on their events page somehow there was are you interested in outdoors? Are you interested in this? Then I wouldn't feel like I was being excluded. Mhm. Mm and I think it's interesting. I think young adults are another group that we really need to pay more attention to in libraries. Young adults who are not necessarily parents um, or in in other roles than being parents. I think we're we're kind of <clears throat> missing them a bit too. In the same way that that we could be um, focusing more on the midlife adults. <clears throat> yeah. And, and one final comment um, from Alan Byrne, that they did programs on upgrading your computer skills oh. that drew disabled and techno technology challenge, that's all of us, technology challenge 55 plus adults without using any of those terms in the program description. I think that the title is, of the program. I just think that's a great, great title, upgrading your computer skills, because it it complements the user a little bit. It, it says you do have some computer skills, and we just want to help you bring them up to speed. Another group that often shows up at some of our introductory kinds of computer classes are uh, immigrants, or people who are learning English. So, I mean, this is the kind of title, I think, that would really appeal to people. That's great. Well, should we move on, Mary? Okay, so uh, we have one more library that we wanted to take a look at today. That's the Coos Bay Public Library. And as we take a look at their website, we wanted to ask the question, how could your library use word of mouth marketing to promote programming for midlife adults? So if you think about that while we do our screen share. I'm just going to Looking good, Jane? Hey, yeah, it's great. Um, there's a few things that are uh, really things to like about the Coos Bay page, and I especially wanted to include it because it's a small town library, and I know a lot of you are in smaller or rural communities. Um, Nothing in it's a for one thing it's a very nice looking page, very clear and simple and, and has a very very appealing graphics and pictures on the front. None of their um programs have an age designation attached to them. Um they have words like beginning or refresher or whatever that signal that this this you know, this was is not for an expert. Um and then they have Foreign Film Friday, which I think is great and maybe very appealing appealing and you'll notice the little note about the mature audience there to signal that it's not necessarily for uh families or children um which answers a little bit of the the questions that come, came up earlier their book groups um they've got the titles listed which I think is really terrific and it gives you a sense of who might be interested in them and those those titles are all across the board all kinds of things that would be um, interesting to people of all ages, um, and so all of these programs are are marketed by interest, um, whether it's marine biology or foreign films or whatever. Um, and and in a small community, this is a great way to draw in as all kinds of different people. Um, and they're pro these programs probably are most interesting to adults in midlife and perhaps seniors, but. The intent is to, to gather everyone in, and I think they've done a really beautiful job of that. And I just wanted to point out um, on each of these program uh, sections here on their homepage, they have a link that says share on Facebook. 
And when I first saw this website, I thought, oh, they must have a Facebook page. But when I did a little research, I realized that Coos Bay Public Library doesn't have their own Facebook page. Um, but what they've done is they've acknowledged that Facebook is where people share information. And so they've included this share on Facebook link on their website, which really gives um, patrons an opportunity to be the brand ambassador for the library. They're taking advantage of word of mouth marketing. So if I click share on Facebook here, it takes me to a screen that lets me post a message. You can see that I've logged in as TLA50. So I'm actually going to say um, this is a great example of a program offered to uh, anyone, not specifically. Oops, bad spelling. <laughs> <laughs> Midlife adults. And when I share this, it's actually going to show up on the Transforming Life After 50 Facebook page, which I'll show you right now. So you can see here's the post that I just did, and I shared the link back to the Coos Bay Library site. So this is a great way to let patrons share with their friends and their family um, interesting things that they see on the library's website. And sometimes word of mouth marketing is all about letting people use channels of communication that they prefer, even if your library is not present on those channels. So it's a good question to ask yourself and your team, where is our community talking? Should we be there? Should we be listening? And Coos Bay obviously decided that Facebook was where they should be. So Jane, did you have anything else you wanted to say about this? Um, just I, I think it's a great way. W I know some of you are frustrated for various reasons about um, getting a Facebook page going. You have political issues or other issues, but I think it's a great way to just leverage your what your users are already doing a little bit and and uh, you know use Facebook without having to or if you can't have your own put your own page up or your own profile up. And I just thought, um, Jane, as you said that, that maybe some people are interested in doing this but don't know how to add the share button on their website. So if that's the case, I can definitely help with some instructions for that. Oh, that would be great. Um, so we'll go back to the PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> and so our question was, again, how could your library use word of mouth marketing to promote programming? And we'll see if you guys have had a chance to talk about that. Looks like Garrett said, I really want to do this share on Facebook thing on my website. So if, if there are people who want instructions, I can create a handout and we can put that up on Moodle. Cool. I think that would be great, Annalisa. I know I want it personally. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's a really interesting comment from Karen Spiel that they are planning an Amharic language computer class series, and they're planning to spread the word to some East African immigrant patrons who attend social gatherings of, of those who speak Amharic. And so that becomes a kind of word of mouth promotion of that program. That's great. I think one thing we're assuming, and in, in, in all this talk about Facebook and Twitter and, and programming, is that all of the conventional things that we've relied on over the years are still going on, of course. We're doing flyers and press releases and bulletin boards and all those kinds of things in, in our communities. I see someone just put Saturday Market or you know town councils, all those kinds of things are going on too and that this is all part of one kind of uh, web of communication with the community. I know one thing, I, I talk about this in, I think, in either this week or next week of our course, but there's definitely a way that you can bring people online from offline and vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know I live in Oakland, and I live near Jack London Square, and mm. the Jack London Square organization has a Facebook page, and they put up signs in the on the sidewalks that say, check us out on Facebook. 
and it's always interesting to think about like, oh, someone could be walking by with their smartphone and think, oh, I wonder what's happening at the library if they see a sign out or a sticker on your window. Jane, you want to make you may want to call attention to the the comment that Garrett just posted if you can see that about a like us on Facebook campaign. Yes, um, I, I noticed that. He says, I'm suggesting that we do a concentrated Like Us on Facebook campaign. And so I, I think that's a great idea, to do a campaign and then to cap it off with some kind of engagement, um, kind of like well, like the Reader's Advisory thing that we did here at MCL or, um, you know, something that has a bit of momentum I think is great. <clears throat> hmm. We probably only have time for another question or two or a comment from you, uh, Jane and Annalisa, because we're getting close to the top of our hour. Well, I know I wanted to say that I think there are tons of questions in chat that we didn't really get to fully yeah. um, talk about, but I'd love to look at the chat and maybe, uh, I don't know if we could continue that discussion in the open forum on Moodle or... Absolutely. Um, because I know, like we did here with the with the PowerPoint, there were things that we saw in Moodle that we were, we were just really wanted to talk about, um, and yeah. so we're happy to continue that conversation. Yeah, um, I would. I I second that, Annalisa. That's great. So then I'm gonna start wrapping us up, and just wanted to say in closing, thank you, Jane and Annalisa, for this very thought-provoking presentation. You've given us some real insights into both the challenges and rewards of programming for this demographic and for utilizing social media skills to engage them. And I'm delighted that you're up for continuing the conversation back in Moodle, and so I hope we'll, we'll capture these questions and those that didn't have a chance to post questions, please, you know, return to Moodle and post them there, and Annalisa and Jane can um, respond to you. But before we sign off, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge all of you for embarking on this journey with its share of bumps in the road for many of you, and commend you all for staying engaged in whatever capacity was feasible for you to this point. We hope you've learned lots, made meaningful connections, and discovered new resources, perhaps seeing your community, your library, and even yourself in new ways. For some, we know that you've been able to begin putting your learning into practice, and we look forward to hearing the results of those efforts in the months to come. Others are just now starting on the path toward in implementation, and we hope you'll keep us posted as well. Either way, we hope all of you have a new appreciation for this evolving stage of midlife and look with new eyes at how libraries can serve and engage midlife adults and others. We also look forward to our final and concluding webinar with Stephen, me, and all the online instructors on June 16th at noon. Please plan to attend this final webinar live, if at all possible, so that we can all share in a final summation and goodbye. Thanks, everyone, for your participation today.